Hi, I'm Jules van Binsberg and a finance professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm Jonathan Burke, a finance professor at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. And this is the All Else Equal podcast. Welcome back, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about bad investment advice. In particular, we're going to look at three pieces of financial advice that you often hear in the news, on websites, or in talk shows, and we're going to critically evaluate to what extent such commonly given financial advice actually makes sense. And Jonathan, I think the first one that we should look at is a piece of investment advice given by Suze Orman regarding the refinancing of your mortgage. In particular, she made the claim that refinancing your mortgage, even if it's at a lower interest rate, is something you shouldn't do because the term of your mortgage may increase and therefore paying your mortgage for a longer period of time is not a good idea. What do we think of that? Yeah, specifically that you pay more interest if you refinance at a lower interest rate because the mortgage takes longer to pay back. So this actually... You can just Google yourselves. She says this in many different places. I'm looking at a particular place, which was on time.com. It's called Next Advisor. Anyway, so here's what Suze Orsman has to say. Before you jump into a refinance, Suze Orsman has some advice you should consider. If it's going to put you behind on paying off your mortgage, consider how much you're really saving. For example, If you have a 22 years left on a 30-year mortgage and you refinance into a new 30-year mortgage, you have just added eight years to your timeline of paying off your home. Being strapped with mortgage for an additional eight years can outweigh the benefits of a lower interest rate. Jonathan, one thing that this violates, I think, is the basic time value of money arguments that we teach in our classes. And you actually have a very nice set of rules for this. Yes, I call them the rules of time travel, okay? And this is really bad investment advice. If you can refinance at a lower rate and you don't have to pay any fees, you're always better off doing so. So let's talk about that. So let's start with the rules of time travel. There are three rules of time travel. The first rule is you cannot compare cash flows unless they occur at the same point in time. So a very important principle in finance is you can only compare cash flows that occur at the same point in time. The second rule of time travel is if you want to move the cash flows forward in time, you need to compound the cash flows. The third rule of time travel is if you want to move them backwards in time, you need to discount the cash flows. And so the way I generally explain this to my students, Jonathan, is that I compare it to using different currencies. So nobody would argue that if I have 100 yen and $100, that together I have 200. People would say those are not measured in the same units and therefore I can't add them. The same is true for cash flows that happen at different times. So if a cash flow happens now and I want to have the same, say, $100, and I have a similar $100 in 10 years from now, I cannot say 100 plus 100 is 200. There's an exchange rate that can convert one to the other, and that exchange rate in this example is the interest rate. So without taking into account the effect of interest rates, what you call compounding and discounting, we cannot compare cash flows that happen at different points in time. And it's ubiquitous in the world where you see people make this mistake. For example, the government requires a disclosure statement when you get a mortgage, and on that disclosure statement, they have the total amount of interest paid, which violates the rule that you can only compare cash flows that occur at the same point in time. So adding up interest payments that occur at different times is a meaningless calculation. So, Jules, let's go back to Suze Orsman, and let's make it absolutely clear right off the bat why this is bad investment advice. If you refinance into a longer-term mortgage at a lower interest rate, at no fees, and you make exactly the same payment you made on your prior mortgage, you will pay off that mortgage sooner and have extra money. You are strictly better off. So that's an obvious argument that Suze Orsman is 100% wrong in this case. Well, and so also let's reason through it from the other side. What if you choose to pay the new mortgage? 
while it is true that the new mortgage will last longer, but in the meantime, you do have more money because you're paying a lower payment every time compared to your old mortgage. And that extra money that you're saving, you can spend it on other things. And so therefore, it's true that you have to pay for a little longer, but these savings that you get early on more than offset the fact that you have to make mortgage payments for longer. Exactly right. So it's never the case that you do not want to refinance a mortgage at a lower interest rate. You can always make yourself strictly better off either by making the old payment and paying your mortgage off sooner or making the new payment, which is lower, and just consuming the difference. Or you could even pay off water loan with that money. But overall, you're strictly better off. Now, let's go to investment advice piece two. What you often hear is that as an investor, you should not buy the stocks of a company that you suspect will issue shares because your investment will get diluted if you do so. And so the NBC Frequently Asked Questions section has there an interview where somebody argues the following, and it's still online. It's been online for quite a while now, and nobody's bothered to take it down. It says the following. In this context, dilution refers to the effect of adding more shares to the pool of a stock that is already trading in the open market. For example, if you own stock in a company with 1 million shares trading at $10 each, and the company decides to issue another 1 million shares, your holdings would be diluted by those new shares. Since the company hasn't done anything to increase its value, the stock would drop to $5. Presumably, they're computing here that because the shares double, but the value is the same, the stock price must go in half. And then they say, curiously, it is not much different than what happens to your savings when the government starts printing too much money. So it's very easy to see why this investment advice is wrong. Imagine the following. Imagine we have a company that has $100 in a bank account with one share outstanding. And this company decides to sell another share for $100. And so now there are two shares outstanding and $200 in the bank account. And the value of share is still $100. And so what the quote clearly gets wrong is the statement that if you issue new shares and you have more money as a company, that that money would be useless or worthless if you didn't do anything with it. But money is money and a dollar is a dollar. And whether you've done anything with it, yes or no, doesn't mean that its value is zero if you decided not to do anything with it yet. And so therefore, this is clearly a fallacy. And so let's talk about the conditions under which you should and shouldn't be worried about dilution. Okay, so now, obviously, if you have $100 in the bank account and you issue another share and the shareholder pays $100 for that share, there's no dilution. But what if the shareholder pays $80 for the share? What happens then? No, if the new person comes in and they get a discount and they would unfairly get the same stake as you, the old shareholder, for a cheaper price, then I think you should be worried about dilution. But the opposite also holds, Jonathan. If the new shareholder pays $120 and therefore overpays for the stock when they come in, that actually does the opposite of diluting the share value for you. Your share price will now go, say they pay 120 then your share price will go up to 110 because it's now the 100 that you put in, the 120 that they put in, divided by two gets you to $110. Yeah, so let's just go through that. If they pay $80, then we had $100 in the bank account, they paid 80, their two shares outstanding, so now the share price drops from $100 to $90. If they pay $120, now there's $220 in the bank account, two shares outstanding, share price goes to $110. But now Jules, Presumably, there's a market out there. So when you issue stock, people compete. What's going to happen? Well, if people can compete and therefore the stock price will go to its fair value, then, of course, the new shareholder, if the fair stock price is $100, they will pay $100 too. And so the competitive pressure is going to guarantee that the new share will neither increase the value or decrease the value of the stock. Right. In other words, if the share price is 80 then I'm going to say, wait a minute, I'm going to pay 81 because I know it's going to be worth 90 the minute the money enters the company and then somebody else will compete with me. And the only time the market will clear is if the share price goes back to $100. All right, but now let's look at a different situation. And this is a situation that a lot of people think implies dilution, but actually doesn't. 
look at the following example. We we'll go back to there's one shareholder, $100 in the bank, and that one shareholder goes to Vegas, puts $50 on black, the wheel ends up on red, and therefore they lose the $50, which means that now there's only $50 in the bank. But to keep operating this firm between quotation marks, we do need to have $100 at least. And so therefore, we need to issue more stock. And so when we do issue that stock, the stock price will issue at $50, right? The company's worth $50. We'll issue one more share for $50. There'll be $100 in the bank account, two shares outstanding, and each share will be worth $50. So now it is true, a $100 share dropped to $50. But it wasn't because we issued another share. It's because the guy went to Las Vegas and lost $50. So he took a bet. The bet didn't pay off. There's no causal relationship here where the issuing of the share causes the dilution. No, it is the fact that the money was lost that is causing the person to have to issue more stock at a lower price. So again, arguing that the dilution caused the price drop is getting the causality wrong. Now, I do think, Jonathan, this relates a lot to a discussion we often see in venture capital, right? Because in venture capital, we hear all the time that they, venture capitalists use the dilution terminology. So I think this has quite a big parallel to the last example, where if the stock price drops for fundamental reasons because you went to Vegas, then in the next round of financing, we issue at a lower price. Right. So often people in venture capital constantly talk about dilution. What I think they mean is exactly this. In venture capital, it's a very risky endeavor, sometimes things don't go well, and you have to issue more stock in order to keep the business running, what often is called the down round. And in that case, you are quote unquote deluded. Whether you're not deluded because of the stock issuance, you're deluded because something went wrong and you need a new investor to come in and keep the financing going, but the company's worth less because something went wrong with the company, right? The other form of dilution that people worry about is the fact that let's say the company does fantastically, but in order to grow, it requires investment and it requires more people. So the angels, they start off, say you have an angel investor, owns 50% of the company at the beginning, the company does brilliantly, does an RPO, at the end, that angel owns 1% of the company, and he says, well, I was deluded, I used to own 50, and now I'm only 1%. But in terms of the dollars, he's made an enormous amount of money. And he's ignoring the fact that the company wouldn't have been successful if people hadn't come after him and made the investments and added the expertise. And so I think there, Jonathan, a part of the confusion is that we need to be precise about what sort of dilution we're talking about. Is it dilution of voting rights or is it dilution of the value of the financial stake in dollars that you own? And it is true that if you own a smaller share of the company, you have fewer voting rights. But sometimes it might be a good thing that you have fewer voting rights because if other shareholders can come in and add value to the company and make you richer, that might actually be the thing that you want to happen. It's not necessarily better to have more voting rights. And furthermore, if you want to have just more voting rights and there is an open market for the shares, then you can always just go in and buy more shares. Exactly. So again, you're ignoring the fact that you have less voting rights might actually be good for you because the people who are giving voting rights to are adding an enormous amount of value and you're participating in that value added. Let's now go to the last piece of financial advice that we often hear. And let's think a little bit about the conditions under which this piece of advice could make sense. But we're also going to look at conditions in which it really doesn't make any sense. I think you're being a little optimistic here, Jules. I just think this is bad investment advice. But let's see, okay? It's dollar cost averaging. What is dollar cost averaging? Dollar cost averaging is the idea that if you want to invest in the market, say you want to invest a million dollars in the market, don't invest a million dollars immediately. Invest the billion dollars over a period of time. So let's say invest $50,000 every day until you've reinvested a million. And the idea is that that's going to be less risky. So if you go to Investopedia and you read what they have to say about this, it says dollar cost averaging involves investing the same amount of money in a target security at regular intervals over a certain period of time, regardless of price. By using dollar cost averaging, investors may lower the average cost per share and reduce the impact of volatility on their portfolios. So is that correct investment advice? Well, you know, the first thing, Jonathan, I want to point out that there are a lot of things in this definition that are quite ambiguous. It says 
at regular intervals over a certain period of time. In the example that you just gave, you said, let's do 20 days of 50,000. Why couldn't I just do 100 days of 10,000? Why is that any worse or any better? And who decides then over what horizon you're supposed to do this? And can I take this to its logical extreme where I need to put in $1 over the next, I don't know how many days? Exactly. The main idea though is that this piece of investment advice ignores a very important principle in financial economics, which is a dollar in your pocket and a dollar in the market is still a dollar. Ignoring trading costs and assuming it's a liquid market, if I have a dollar in my pocket, I could turn it into a dollar in the market by buying, or I could turn the dollar in the market to a dollar in my pocket by selling. So there could be no difference between a dollar in my pocket and a dollar in the market. And so at any point during dollar cost averaging, you can apply that principle. Right? You can put all of it in the market or take all of it out. And so the dollar cost averaging violates that principle, which to me means that it is bad investment advice. Indeed. So let's think about the following. Suppose that I ended up at the end of my process and the $1 million, however much it was, is now in my account. Am I now supposed to again apply the same principle and take it all out and start putting it back in again just to reduce the volatility? Because if that applied to that first decision path, why wouldn't it apply from now on going forward? So there seems to be what we call in economics a dynamic inconsistency in this logic. Exactly. So now, why don't we humor you, Jules, and then talk about, well, could this investment advice ever make sense? So let's all agree that if returns are unpredictable, then this is bad investment advice. This violates the principle of a dollar in your pocket and a dollar in the market are the same thing. But what if that isn't true? What if it's the case that returns were somehow predictable? Well, so it is possible that this decision rule that because the dollar amount is constant, the fraction that you put in every time of your wealth, that wealth goes up and down, the amount that you have in there, it does mean that you, in percentage terms, more aggressively invest in certain periods than in other periods. And if that level of aggressive investment happens to correlate when returns are higher versus lower, which would be true if returns would be predictable, then it's possible that, practically speaking, this rule could pay off. And so I think that the main objection that we would have to this logic is if you thought returns were predictable in a particular way, and that's your belief, why don't you then just directly go for maximizing your investment strategy based on that predictability? Why would you take this somewhat arbitrary rule of thumb thing and hope that it will deliver the return predictability extra return that you're hoping for? Why not directly go for exploiting the return predictability? Yeah, I think that's the observation. That it's true that if there is some predictability in returns and the predictability happens to correlate with this rule, that you can make extra money. But why bother with the happens to correlate? If you think returns are predictable, then maximize the predictability. My own view is that for most investors, returns are unpredictable, right? I mean, you know, some investors are highly informed and they may have superior information. And those investors are sophisticated. And I promise you, I'm not following dollar cost averaging, right? But for the rest of us, we don't know what is predictable and what's going to happen in the future. And for us, the optimal strategy is not to follow a dollar cost averaging strategy. One thing we should talk about is. The intuition of why people like this is they say, well, no, 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 wait a minute. I don't want to put all my money in at one time because that's too risky. And so that intuition is actually wrong. Well, the question indeed that that immediately raises, Jonathan, is if you are uncomfortable taking that level of risk, then building it up to that level of risk should just make you feel uncomfortable about that level of risk at that point in time when you reach the full investment. So how does this is any different? It's like a little bit the idea that it's the swimming pool equivalent. If I very gradually go into the pool, maybe I somehow can make myself get used to the temperature of the pool or something, but that's generally not how we think about risk aversion. We think about risk aversion as, do you feel comfortable taking this risk, yes or no? If you don't feel comfortable taking it, then don't take it. Don't pretend that by easing into it, you will feel comfortable. With it. Yeah, so the pool example is, it's a very hot day. I know that when I get into that pool, I will feel better, but the process of getting in, I may not. So I could just jump in or go in slowly. It's something like that. But you have to know that at the end, you want 
that level of risk. And if you want that level of risk at the end, you should also want that level of risk at the beginning. If you don't want that level of risk in the end, then it isn't correct to put all of your money in the market. Then you should think, well, I should have a strategy where some of my money is in bonds and some of my money is in stocks, and I should come to terms with that strategy. Another intuition that I think is incorrect is people say, well, it's like diversification. I get time diversification. Sometimes the market goes up, sometimes the market goes down, and by investing slowly, I get time diversification. And that comes back a bit to what we discussed earlier. If returns are predictable, then there may be some time diversification thing that we can do. But if they're not, then that is just not going to work. Right. And the key issue is that when you talk about diversification across stocks, you get cancellation across the stocks. When you talk about time diversity in time, there's no cancellation. Your whole portfolio goes up and your whole portfolio goes down. There's no cancellation in time. Indeed. Now, Jonathan, now that we've talked to these three, I do want to reiterate a point that I think we've made before on the podcast, which is this. The key principles that drive finance are actually not that difficult, right? The NPV rule and the other decision-making rules that we have, I think they're pretty crystal clear on what they need to do. But the biggest problem that people face is that there are all of these rule of thumb pieces of advice out there that seem so attractive and seem like something that you should be doing, but it's very hard. And if you relate them back to first principles, they often don't make sense. And I think that several of the things we talked about today are exactly examples of that. Yes. So Jules, when I teach finance on the very first day, what I tell the students is finance is not hard. The basic principles of finance are actually very simple. For example, take positive NPV projects, right? And we have many principles like that. What's hard about finance is there are other principles that look equally simple, that are all equally simple, that happen to be wrong. And the hard thing is to tell the difference. And these are three very good examples. I mean, on the surface, it does seem like if I pay more interest, I'm worse off, right? It just happens to be wrong. And it does seem like if I issue more shares, then each share will have a lower claim on the company and the value will go down. It does seem like that's true. It just happens to be wrong. So yes, this is a good example of how what makes finance hard is telling the difference between simple ideas that are right and simple ideas that are wrong. Thanks for listening to the All Else Equal podcast. Please leave us a review at Apple Podcast. We'd love to hear from our listeners. And be sure to catch our next episode by subscribing or following our show wherever you listen to your podcast. For more information and episodes, visit allelseequalpodcast.com or follow us on LinkedIn. The All Else Equal podcast is a production of Stanford University's Graduate School of Business and is produced by University FM.